they've been coming to a board meeting just to sort of show what, they, what they've been up to. Um, the first presentation that came to my mind, to be honest, was Bryn's. Uh, I thought it was super interesting, and I'm sure that some of you will. Bryn is also our valedictorian this year, um, so she's got some serious firepower when it comes to intellect. And uh, as you'll see in a minute, this is just a, a terrific demonstration of what happens when you let uh, a really qualified and talented teacher get together with students who can just do anything they want if they put their minds to it. So I'm, I'm thrilled that Bryn and Josh have come to join us tonight whenever Josh gets here. And with that, I'm going to ask Ms. Camp to come to the microphone just quickly and fill in any blanks that I may have left out in this brief introduction. AP Capstone is a two-year course. It starts with seminar, and they spend a year in the slog. They have to learn how to um, really deconstruct arguments, do research uh, vet sources, understand how to construct quality arguments. And what you'll see here is they also learn how to give effective oral presentations. Um, and so in their second year, they get to uh, pick a research question and then design their own research so it's no longer looking through what other people have had to say about it. They do that in their literature review, but the research that they're going to present is based on like what they actually designed and then implemented and then analyzed. And so uh, it's pretty impressive stuff, I have to say. Uh, Dr. Lassus is not the only one who feels like he was not the smartest person in the room most of the year. I felt like, wow, what am I doing here? These guys can shoot way further than I, I ever could. So they taught me a lot. So they're pretty impressive presentations. I don't think they have much more to add than you do. All right. Great. Come on up. See Is the, there uh, a slideshow as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah, right. You can do anything you want. Senior year, it's Monday, you're graduating. Three days left. You can do anything you want. Whatever. You guys are selected. I think we're going to come around the front. All right, so with the advent of the digital age, many of us are online near constantly. And you may or may not have noticed that teenagers are online constantly. We are on Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, any form of social media, any way of connecting with our friends really any way of being online. What you might not have realized is that a lot of the times companies are collecting a lot of personal information about users on their websites. They do this to earn money mostly, to target ads towards specific groups of people. And one concern that has arisen over teenagers being online so constantly is that they are not entirely voluntarily giving up access to their personal information. So one idea that has arisen across the world, not even just the United States, is how to reduce the collection of personal information sharing of personal information from minors. One idea that has arose uh, on how to do this is to change the way we ask questions about if you want to share personal information or not. The idea that has arisen is if we want to have negative default settings when we ask people if they want to share information. So just to break that down, a default setting is when you have a question posed to you, what the response is if you do not uh, make a determination yourself. So no default setting for the question, will you share personal information, means you need to make a determination yourself to choose yes or no. You can't just leave the question blank. Whereas on the other hand, if you had an affirmative default, yes would be automatically bubbled in and you would have to make a conscious decision to choose no. So if you don't actually make a choice for yourself, you're choosing to share personal information. On the other hand, if you have a negative default, the no bubble is, is chosen if you don't choose anything yourself. You need to make a conscious decision to choose to share personal information. 
This has been suggested as a way of reducing personal information collection because of the idea of a default preference, which is the idea that you'll be relatively more likely to go along with the option when it's presented as the default than if you had to select it for yourself. So my research goes into this idea of if we're considering negative default settings as a way to reduce personal information sharing collection, what is the effect of default setting of the default setting and the reward offered on personal information sharing? The idea with the reward offered is when you have a default setting preference, what can be done to change that default setting preference? How can you make it more or less likely that people are willing to share personal information? So the experimental design for my project was a combined survey and experiment. It involved 330 high school students. Uh, in each survey, there were three experimental questions. One asked students if they would be willing to share personal information when offered a specific reward. One question asked students if they would be willing to share personal information when offered general reward. And one asked students if they would be willing to share personal information when offered no reward. Beyond that, students were randomly assigned to three different survey versions. One had an affirmative default for all experimental questions, where the automatic response, if none were selected by the student, would be that they would share personal information. One had a negative default for all experimental questions, which means that if no response were selected by the student, it would automatically decline to share personal information. And one had no default for all experimental questions. Just to give you an idea of what that looks like, uh, the top version over here is the version with no default setting for the question. Right here is the affirmative default version, and right here is the negative default version. So the hypotheses going into this experiment, the first set really deal with the effect of the default setting itself. Uh, it's that participants will be most likely to share personal information if they have an affirmative default for a question, and will be least likely to share personal information if they have a negative default per question. This is pretty in line with the idea of a default preference, nothing too surprising here. The second set of hypotheses is moving into less research territory. It deals with the effect of rewards on likelihood to share personal information, and it's that participants will be most likely to share personal information when offered a specific reward, and least likely when offered no reward. This feeds into the idea of, hey, if you're offered a reward, you're probably more likely to do something. So just to break down the results of this experiment a little, uh, you can see this is a chart with a percent of participants willing to share personal information. Uh, the horizontal axis is the default setting with affirmative default, negative default, no default and negative default, and the vertical axis is the reward offered for that specific experimental question. So when no reward was offered for sharing personal information and you had an affirmative default setting, 66.3% of participants were willing to share personal information. On the other hand, when there was no default and no reward was offered, 46.5% of participants uh, were willing to share personal information. On the lower end, when you had a negative default for the question, you can see that 26.5% we're willing to share personal information. So you can see this trend continues across the experimental questions. You still have the most willing to share personal information for affirmative default, and the fewest willing to share personal information for negative default across all of those experimental questions. So we can draw from these results that a default preference does exist for personal information sharing on social media. So again, this isn't uh, too profound a realization, but there are some specific implications for the area of personal information sharing specifically. One is that consumers do make irrational decisions based on default settings. We would expect if consumers and users on social media were not paying attention to the default setting, we would expect to have the same response rates across the board for each of these, for each survey version. We can see that's not the case. Another thing it shows is that if companies do want to increase personal information collection of consumers, they should use affirmative default settings when asking if consumers want to share personal information. On the other hand, if governments want to protect the privacy of consumers, legislation mandating negative default settings would be likely to reduce personal information sharing. So moving on to the second set of uh, hypotheses related to the effect of rewards. Uh, this table here is the same as the one before, but I'm highlighting the vertical axes to show the difference between the experimental questions. Uh, we can see with the affirmative default and no reward offered, 66.3% of participants were willing to share personal information. Uh, with the general reward offered, same affirmative default, 39.4%. And with the specific reward, same affirmative default, 52.9%. 
this is not expected. Um, I shall note before I said that I expected that the highest uh, rate would be for a specific reward and the lowest rate would be for no reward, which is almost the opposite of what happens. You can see that the highest uh, willingness to share personal information was when no reward was offered, the lowest when general reward was offered, and the intermediate when the specific reward was offered. This wasn't really expected, but you can see it was a trend repeated across survey versions. In every survey version, the greatest number of participants were willing to share information with no reward offered, and the fewest when a general reward was offered. So this is really unexpected, that offering certain rewards can actually disincentivize personal information sharing. So there are a couple of reasons this could have occurred. One, obviously, is a limitation in the experimental design itself. The order of experimental questions wasn't randomized throughout the survey. Uh, the first question asked offered no reward for personal information sharing, as, and you'll note that that's the one that had the greatest number of participants willing to share personal information. And the last question offered a general reward, and you'll note that that had the fewest participants willing to share personal information. So that could have definitely tied into that result. Another limitation that could have led to this result is that the wording of experimental questions was slightly inconsistent. Uh, the experimental question offering a general reward uh, referenced more personal information sharing rather than just personal information sharing, which could have led to this result. But assuming that one of the limitations wasn't to blame for this result, there are a couple of other reasons that this conclusion could have arisen. So why would rewards actually disincentivize personal information sharing? One idea is that the rewards offered were deemed insubstantial. But if this were the case, we would expect relatively consistent numbers across experimental questions. So the idea that the reward was insubstantial doesn't really play into the results. A more likely explanation is that the decision seems more significant when you're offered a reward. It's the idea that, if, hey, if you're looking at this question that wants you to share personal information, you're just ready to check the box, but you're offered a reward and it makes you think, hmm, do I really want to do this? Another similar explanation is that offering an external incentive decreases intrinsic motivation. You might naturally want to do something, but the presence of a reward makes you less likely to intrinsically want to do that. That also seems kind of counterintuitive, but it is a well-documented phenomenon. Uh, assuming that one of these reasons is to blame for this conclusion and it's not a result of an experimental limitation, there are some significant implications in the area of personal information sharing. One is that consumers need to be cued to think about privacy concerns. In a lot of these explanations, the reason that the consumer is less likely to share personal information is because they were somehow cued to think about their personal privacy. This really matters if you are trying to convince consumers to share information or to convince them to not share information. Similarly, if a company does want to collect personal information, it would need to research the effectiveness of the reward it decides to offer. On the other hand, legislation shouldn't really be focused on the exact rewards because as you can see, it can be somewhat inconsistent and should instead focus on users to think about privacy concerns. With that being said, the major conclusions of my research and two uh, teenage uh, decisions on sharing information on social media is that to reduce personal information sharing of minors, uh, mandating negative default settings and cueing users to think about their own privacy would be effective ways to do this. Thank you. Any board members have any questions or comments? Oh, I just wanted to ask a question. Do you hear your peers actively talking about protecting their personal information? Uh, not generally speaking. No? Okay. <laughs> but my question was going to be, how did you uh, come up with this um, problem? Yeah, so I was always really interested in behavioral economics and the ideas of people doing irrational things and why that happened and how to predict irrationality. So it kind of arose from that. And I'm also, I'm planning to go into computer science as a major, so it kind of combined those interests. Bryn, one common thing uh, that I, I've noticed across social media and also in finance and et cetera, is that frequently the justification for changing privacy settings from the corporation's perspective is to improve the user experience, um, which you know really doesn't mean much. Uh, 
is there have is there any is there any thought in your research to specific language that should be expected or that might be legislated? You know, we want, we would all like to be spoken to and talked to like thinking adults. Like we're planning to use this information only to sell you stuff in the right hand column or we're gonna sell this to health insurance companies. You know, that they're two very, very different things. Yeah, so one of the first sources I came across while I was doing my research was the expansion of privacy notices and how they keep getting longer and harder to read, and thus consumers are less likely to read them. So one of the things I definitely noted is that we need to have clearer language in our privacy policies, and we need to make them a lot shorter. Uh, the grade level, I believe, has expanded from an eighth grade reading level to a grade 14 reading level over a period of 10 years. So one of the major things suggested is that we need to make privacy policies readable is the big issue. Thank you. I'll just note that when you do a dissertation, you get pounded with questions, and you either collapse on the floor because you can't answer the question, or you come up with a question like that, which makes you look even better than the presentation. <laughs> So you, you absolutely nailed it, Rick. <laughs> Any other questions from the board? Okay, Rick, thank you so much. <laughs> right on cue. <laughs> Josh, do you want to stay in the same spot or do you want to be out there? I can stand in the same spot. Actually, Ms. Camp, do you want to just introduce Josh and maybe give a little background about his sure. work and anything else you feel like saying? Oh, sure. So, Josh, I'll give you a couple of minutes to breathe and get your, get your space. Um, now I'm on the spot here. Um, so, it's really interesting. We had six uh, students who continued on to research, and they all took very different um, tracks in terms of what they wanted to look at. And it took a, a lot of time to actually settle on what their, their final ideas were. And I remember in the spring after they finished the AP seminar course, Josh said to me, I want to do something with self-driving cars. And in my very limited mind, I'm like, well, there's just like, how's he going to do this? Is he going to be testing them on the streets? Where is he getting one of these? I couldn't, I couldn't even fathom what he was going to dream up with this. And I, I said, all right, think about it over the summer. We'll see how it goes. Because really, I'm not supposed to have any say in it at all, just as long as it's feasible and nobody dies. And honestly, <laughs> Josh, when you see this presentation, you will be blown away. Because I, I mean, half the time, and, and he'll say, he's like, no offense, I didn't really have anybody who could help me. I'm like, Josh, half the time, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> so he did this entirely on his own. It is amazing stuff. And, uh, and I think he has an incredible future ahead of him if he just keeps on this track. So. Enjoy this. <laughs> so I did my project on the light sensitivity of vision-based object detection and how this relates to self-driving cars. So first of all, what is object detection? It's the process of identifying objects in an image using a computer and placing bounding boxes around them. So both localizing and labeling objects from a simply an image like you get from the camera. It's useful for many different autonomous systems, not just self-driving cars, but many robots and just uh, automation in general. So here's an, here's an example of object detection in, in action. You can see as someone walks through a crowded city street, it's identifying cars, people, traffic lights, and putting the respective bounding boxes around them. And this is a very important technology for self-driving cars because this is how they perceive the world in front of them. And so if they see a car, they know to stop. If they see a person, they know to let them cross the street. It's one of the main focuses of research in current safety for self-driving cars is improving this technology. And so there are two big self-driving car crashes. They're very well publicized. You might have seen them yourself. One was by Uber self-driving car development vehicle. It was very late at night. 
and as you can see, uh, there was not much to be seen in the image, and the car failed to detect a person right in front of it before hitting them and killing them. And in quite the opposite scenario, it was an extremely bright day. And as the car was traveling along the highway, the light from the sun on the horizon blinded the camera and it overexposed the camera and the car which was traveling this way was not able to make out the side of a white tractor trailer that was passing in front of it. So it continued forward and shoot off the top of the car and kill the driver of that, that car as well. So out of these, both these two large, uh, very publicized fatalities, self-driving cars, both seem to be related to an extreme lighting condition. One, complete lack of light, and one in a, a great amount of light. And so that led me to my research question. How is light intensity related to the accuracy of vision-based object detection? And so the importance of this question is that one, many researchers have simply assumed that the relationship exists. They've simply assumed that light has some relation to the accuracy of these object detection algorithms. And while many have assumed it, many have also not actually put a number to it or a quantity to actually see the magnitude of the effect that light has on it. Nobody knows if it's a minimal or major effect that light can have on the accuracy. And there have been some studies about the camera settings, such as exposure and ISO, but uh, the methodology I'm conducting uh, is quite different from these studies and is answering the question. And so my ultimate goal of my research was to come up with plots that plotted accuracy on the y-axis versus light intensity on the x-axis. And I wanted to see as light intensity increased how that affected the accuracy of these algorithms. So I wanted to see if maybe super bright light made them less accurate or dark light made them less accurate. Maybe there's an optimal point in between. So to do this, I had to first choose a data set of images. And I chose the COCO data set, which is, stands for Common Objects and Context. And so it's just a data set of a bunch of everyday images you see. It could be a picture of this library and it would have these annotations for every single image that would have bounding boxes around. The microphones, the people, the books, just giving context to the image in order to train these algorithms. And so in order to have this plot of accuracy versus light intensity, I had to first come up with a way to generate light intensity from an image. And in order to do that, I found this equation from a separate study I found online, which basically weights the pixel values in an image to generate an overall lightness. So it turns out to us humans, the color green contributes the most to how bright we perceive something is. So that's why you can see here, G for green pixels has the largest constant power. So a green image is, you can see as the brightest. And so for every single image in this data set, I quantify the brightness using this equation. And then for the y-axis, for every single image in the data set, I also found an accuracy of different object detection algorithms. And in doing that, I can see the accuracy of every image versus the image's brightness, and then I can see the relationship. And so the first thing I did was I had to qualitatively check that the uh, light measuring method I was using was correct. So I quantified the light in every single image and ordered them by their brightnesses. And so these three images were in the top 2% of brightness of images. And you can see your, for yourself that they're obviously very bright. And these three images were in the darkest subset of images. So I knew that, I knew as a first step that my light quantification method was in fact working just from this simple chip. And so next, I had to compute the accuracy on every single image in the data set. And to do this, I had to use a Google Cloud Compute VM because the laptop I was using was not capable of, uh, didn't, it didn't have the processing power to run through all the pictures and run the algorithms. So I took advantage of the Google Cloud VM Cloud Computing Service, and I ran these algorithms through basically a way to detect the accuracy on all of them. And I got an accuracy based on comparing the ground truth to the model produced labels. So I took three different models, and I ran them, ran the images through every model. And these all produced their own 
annotations with their own boxes around the different objects in the room. And so I took those uh, proposals from those algorithms and I compared them to the ground truth proposal that was given from the data set. And then com in comparing these two, uh, in comparing these annotation files, you could get an accuracy for every single image. And so I used a, a Facebook Detectron uh, GitHub library. Facebook basically released a bunch of tools to help with like, machine learning. So I specifically used Faster RCNN, Mask RCNN, and RedmanNet. And these are all uh, neural net based approaches, which is currently the, uh, the most popular way of doing this object detection. And the differences in these three different algorithms is just um, the structure of the layers and their interconnectedness. There's, there's nothing really intuitive about the difference, but they, they do perform differently. So the limitations of my set. I was limited to only 5,000 images. This is because the data set I was using had 140,000 images, but the algorithm, algorithms were trained on 135,000 of those. So it's generally a malpractice to test on the same images you train on in machine learning. So that's why I was limited to only 5,000 images for testing. Also, not all the images were in the context of self-driving cars. Like I said, this was a general data set. So while there were about half the images were in the context of transportation with buses and stop signs and things like that, some were simply a uh, kitchen table with an apple and a book. And also, these aren't the exact same models used as private companies such as Tesla. Uh, basically, these algorithms are the secret to their success in these fields, so they never release them publicly. Although, uh, they have released that they are using neural nets, so these are very similar. And in my results, I found that all three neural nets, even though specific details are different between them, they all have a, generally the same relationship. So you could abstract this to Tesla saying that since they are also using a similar neural net approach, they most likely have the same uh, relationship between light and accuracy. And also, this data set will not display the absolute accuracy of object detection algorithms. This is because in the data set I used, every single image uh, was, they were sure that a human would be able to perceive the objects. In it. When in reality, for example, in the case of the, uh, the Florida self-driving car crash where the camera was overexposed, even a human might not be able to make anything out of the image that it, because it's so overexposed. And so an image like that would never be included in the data set. So in fact, the, the accuracy of the models is, would, in the real world, would most likely would be less than what displayed. And so here's my first plot. This was for faster RCNN. And as you can see, this AP is, stands for average precision, and it's a quantitative way to, uh, it quantifies the accuracy of the object detection model. And on the x-axis, you can see the image luminance, which is how bright the image is. You can see, as the image luminance increases, there's a general correlation that the accuracy of the algorithms also increases. You can see that for mask RCNN, there's a similar correlation, similar positive correlation, and the same for red. So you can see there's a very similar relation with all three algorithms, which suggests that this isn't specific to only these three, and is more related to general uh, neural net approaches to object detection in general. To continue, uh, I was able to prove at the 0.001 significance level, which is very confident, that there is a positive correlation between the light in an image and the accuracy of an object detection algorithm. And in addition, the AP averages were slightly below 0 0.5. And if you look at current uh, competitions between university leaderboards, uh, their averages are all in the, about the same area, slightly below 0 0.5. So the models I used were, um, uh, were achieving state-of-the-art results in accuracy. And the average image luminance was 112.4. So here you can see a histogram of the image luminance, and so you can see that uh, the vast majority of images are within a certain range, and there's only very few in the extreme brightnesses uh, of above 200 and below 30. And so the, what are the immediate implications of this? We can for sure say 
that object detection is significantly affected by light intensity. And relating to self-driving cars, we, can, we know that they won't perform without regard to lighting condition. So if this is something that you require as someone sitting in the, the seat of these cars, if you want them to work the same, whether it's dark, light, rain, or snow, uh, they're currently not in the state to do that. And if that's what you want, then you should get in that seat. <laughs> and uh, there's also some speculative implications that I couldn't prove statistically, but I still thought were worth mentioning. This is more caused by a, a lack of sample size because I did not have the uh, sample size to uh, come up with a very confident uh, numeric proof. But so uh, I also had hypothesized that accuracy would decrease in very bright intensities, like in that car crash I mentioned. Uh, I said when the pixels became overexposed, that they lose information and to detect objects. And you can actually see in the farthest data point, the highest image luminance, it actually decreased, uh, I imagine it's a significant amount, and differs from the positive correlation that you've seen along all the other points. And while this wasn't enough to prove my original hypothesis right, because it was only a single data point, it does suggest that it's true. Um, this could also be a bias of a quirky fit because with the fit I use, but it won't seem to point the same way. But this is definitely evidence that self-driving cars can also suffer in strong summer. And so in order to investigate the scenario of stronger sunlight further, I would simply need a larger sample size, which I could accomplish by using a larger data set. And so, what are potential solutions to this? The uh, potential failure of object detection in low light scenarios. Well, one it could be really something really simple, like stronger headlights or street lights. And this really isn't ideal, because I think most people expect self-driving cars to be able to function with a similar vehicle that a human drives. So self-driving cars shouldn't, ex uh, shouldn't require brighter headlights or brighter street lights. Um, one very popular solution that many people are proposing in the research community are LiDAR sensors. And these don't use cameras at all. Rather, they bounce lasers off of surrounding objects. And they get a 3D image of the world around them. And really, the biggest thing keeping these from becoming popular is simply their price. This sensor here, which would be, you would usually put only one of these on a car, but a single one of those costs $60,000. So research teams are putting these on $20,000 stands when in reality no one could ever afford a car like that because the sensors put on it make it a hundred to two hundred thousand dollar car. And also computer vision algorithms can simply be improved and it is a very popular current area of study and improvements are constantly being made. So I imagine that in the next couple of years they'll continue to improve these computer vision algorithms and make them more and more accurate. Can I ask a, you know, hopefully it's a layup. In, so you seem to be very, very learned in all of this. And there are all types of different companies experimenting with these autonomous driving uh, usage. Whether it's Amazon, whether it's Tesla, whether it's Audi, so car companies, delivery companies. Which industry do you handicap as being the one most likely to nail this? Um, for the industry that's more like most likely to develop this in. Yeah. So, for example, do you think Amazon um, comes up with a very robust solution quicker than, say, Tesla, Audi, or Toyota? I'd say currently it's most likely Tesla because they're very strictly um, only camera-based object detection. We're seeing the failures of these uh, camera-based methods. Many companies are actually straying more to laser sensors 
and away from the camera-based object detection. So Tesla is really doing the most research and development on these camera uh, vision-based methods. So I think they're most likely to uh, solve the Thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, I have a question. Were, when you were compiling your images, your 5,000, did you take any like in a parking garage or was it mostly outside? I know you said you had images of a table and an apple, but did you do anything like in a parking garage where it would be an indoor driving situation? Mm -hmm. I, um, so I, I took a data set that was online and they provided the images themselves, but in looking through it, I did find at least one or two that were in the parking garage. So, yeah, about 50% of the images were in relation to uh, transportation. Well, again, great job. I want to thank Josh and Brent for taking time tonight to share their expertise. In it's, it's inspiring to see this kind of work coming out of high schools, and I like to thank this camp, too. You can imagine how challenging it can be to try to harness or just coach along to students like this, among many others, uh, with so much talent and so much to, to offer. It's not easy to do as a teacher. So thank you, Ms. Camp. Thank you, guys. Construction update. Uh, the demo at the middle school auditorium. The demolition was completed. Uh, the, con <coughs> the contractor has started working on the uh, inside framing, and the work will ramp up when school uh, is closed. So next Monday they will start on uh, day shift and probably put in uh, approximately 10 hour days uh, working. And so far all on schedule and uh, no hiccups yet. That's all. I have. And the committee reports. Uh, uh, we have not met since our last meeting. I don't know when we are we? Anything else? I don't know if that's our case. Um, Kirk and Ms. Clark. I'll take that. I'm going to take that one. Um, Mr. be with us tonight. But um, we just met before this meeting, and uh, we had a great presentation about uh, the World Language Program and the avenues and directions that we're taking to support these children to, to from, from middle school on into high school. Uh, it was also mentioned that we are one of the few, if not the only middle school in the state to have uh, American Sign Language. And that class has been very successful. And we are, um, we also heard uh, about some from our math uh, directors to talk about ways to support our children our students uh, to pass the state mandate, to give extra support to the students who need it to help um, pass the state mandate graduation requirements. So we have a lot of uh, 
great um, new classes and things that I, and uh, offerings that we're going to be rolling out as they fine tune everything. So it was a really great meeting. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, finance facility. That's me. Uh, we also just met a couple things. Uh, one was uh, every five years we tend to go through kind of reassessment of all the different um, services that we use and they did one from a banking perspective this um, year. You'll see it on the agenda when we approve it. Uh, we're going to move the board to investors bank. Uh, this is actually going to give us better banking, cash banking services and actually help us get higher interest rates in the near term to um, give a little bit more money in the district. Uh, we did close out the 2018-19 uh, anticipated capital reserve deposit, which is going to be right around half a million dollars. Don't panic. Um, it was projected to be higher than that. However, there were a number of unanticipated expenses that came in during the year. Um, one, which none of us knew, which was the, uh, the new bleachers and, and dividers in the gym. Washington Avenue School sewer lines. It's a number of different things that add up to around 550000 So generally speaking, every year we do right around a million dollars. Uh, this year it is lower, but there is uh, very um, distinct reasons as to why. And last but not least, we continue to discuss the capital project planning for 2020-2021, which does include the possibility of a small referendum. Uh, we continue to look at all the different things uh, across the field that are required and necessary, and we do want to take advantage of a low well, interest rates. Two is a lot of these projects will get some uh, debt relief from the state, which will reduce the actual net number to the community. Um, so we're continuing to look at that and see where we want to take it. And that's it. Policy and planning, Mr. Arnold. Nothing to report. Any questions for anybody? Liaison reports, Chatham Borough, Ms. Brother's not here, Township, Ms. Clark is not here, Athletic Boosters. I'll take that as nothing. Sal, Performing Arts Boosters. Uh, sure. Um, first, we'd like to offer quick congratulations to Jack Pasacrita and Evelyn Tomorrow on their acceptance to the prestigious Juilliard Pre-College Program. In general, it's been a great year for Performing Arts in Chatham. The department participated in over 60 performances throughout the school year. Thank everybody for their patronage, whether it's the spring musical or a first grade concert. Community supported any performance is important, so on behalf of the department, thank you very much. There will be updates throughout the summer and uh, some new developments in performing arts, including the completion of the new middle school auditorium and new teachers joining us this fall. And finally, the department wishes Crystal Grazer and Amelia Muccia the best of luck in their future endeavors and thanks them for their dedication to the Chatham Schools. Thank you, Mr. Arnick. Um, Chatham Education Foundation, Ms. Kenny. Um, I just wanted to echo the comments of Dr. Sousa about the TEDx program that was run. It was uh, funded by CEF and um, the, uh, the gener generosity of the CEF and uh, um, contributions made that made the program possible. So Chatter Recreation, nothing to report. And Mr. Chicarelli on the P2 edition. Okay, thank you. Um, Mike, am I allowed to um, motion the minutes because I wasn't here last time? Yes, you just need to stay. All right, uh, motion by Wong. Second. For roll call vote for the approval minutes for the June 3rd public and executive sessions. Okay, I'm going to do the. Um, Executive, the regular first, and the executive, because in the executive session two, Mr. Hunt, please do the same. Okay. So, um, regular and executive one, uh, Mr. Hunt. Yes. Ms. Chambers. Yes. Ms. Chibrelli. Abstain. Ms. Kenny. Yes. And Mr. Valenti. Yes. And Mr. Gilbert. I have to uh, Passes four zero two. Executive session two, Mr. Hunt. Abstain. Ms. Chambers? Yes. Ms. Ciccarelli? Abstain. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Mr. Valenti? Yes. And Mr. Gilfield? Abstain. And that passes 3-0. Good. Good. Um, we are now have our first opportunity to public commentary. Um, that was the public comment time limit. Hearing citizens during the public commentary section of the agenda is an opportunity for any member of the public to be heard about issues which are or are not 
topic scheduled for the current meeting to help facilitate an orderly meeting and permit all to be heard. Speakers will be asked to limit their comments to a reasonable length of time. And if we don't run up to the microphone, Hi, I am Lisa Smith. My son is a student that receives IEP services. I'm tonight representing the Chatham CPAG organization. Um, I wanted to uh, give everyone an update as to our activities since the last Board of Ed meeting. Um, we had our uh, joint meeting in, on June 6th. We would like to thank so much Dr. D'Elia for attending, uh, Dr. Lanza, Jill Weber, and Mary Chambers. Uh, we had a wonderful conversation around uh, the dyslexia program um, and discussing how we were going to work together to prepare a program on dyslexia awareness in October. Um, we are very happy to hear that three district teachers will be undergoing level one Wilson certification. Um, as many of you know, the training typically takes um, a year, if not more, um, given the amount of time that a teacher is able to dedicate to this. Um, in the meantime, the parents will be continue to be concerned about um, the needs being met for their current students with language-based disabilities. Um, and so we would like to continue to discuss jointly with um, the district, but the plan is to um, cover current students um, that are um, currently not able to um, get access to those three certified teachers. Um, we are hearing some concerns that um, there's only uh, the policy to remediate when a student is about three years behind in grade level and has been in the system for three years. Um, this is what a complaint we're hearing from the parents within our organization. Um, and certainly no parent wants, wants to wait that long until they get uh, support for their services. Um, we're very happy to hear that the district site has been updated to reflect our current CPAG membership as well as a link to our flyer. Um, in early June, we received news that some parents have actively received their flyer with their IEP meeting. And uh, just this morning, I met with um, Mrs. Darkowski at Lafayette, and I received my flyer, and I was really stoked about that to get a copy. So thank you so much for um, helping us with that. Um, we look forward to continuing the collaborative effort with the uh, Board of Ed and the district. Um, we're looking forward to modernizing our data and assessment process, and our next joint meeting is September 5th. Have a wonderful summer, and we look forward to continuing to work with you in the fall. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Keith, you're going to run. Ms. Jane. Good evening. Jane Devlin, Chatham Township. I just want to publicly support the CPEG group and their consistent presence at the Board of Ed meetings. I think it's great to see involved parents at Board of Ed meetings listening to all aspects of the board business. I also would like to comment how refreshing I find it to see liaisons from our borough and township councils often in attendance at the meeting. And I just wanted to close by thanking the administration and the board for all your efforts and dedication this past year and for another successful school year. I know the board sometimes meets over the summer, but I take a summer break. So. Uh, one, one, Jane, there's no, there's no homework over summer either. <laughs> <laughs> no homework over summer. No, there's no homework policy I'm sure over summer. everyone is going and doing fun sunshine things and respite because that is aligned with our wellness focus in the community 
and let's start the school year on a good note next year by continuing to look at wellness and continuing to keep up some of the positive changes we did make with adjustments to the homework over the years. Let's keep going forward with that. But seriously, well, I'm serious about that, but most sincerely, I did want to thank each and every board member and administration. Thank you. Good evening, Billy. Uh, Janet Burrow. Uh, who's the timekeeper tonight? I am. Okay, okay good. I'm sure somebody was there. Uh, I'm here on JC Business tonight. Uh, I would like to announce our 59th Annual Distinguished Service Awards uh, to be held tomorrow night at Charlie Brown's restaurant, 7 o'clock. We will be uh, honoring Mr. Len Resto. And he has done a ton of things around town, and he's very deserving of this award. Uh, we will also be giving out somewhere in the neighborhood of $40,000 worth of scholarships and grants. Uh, as I have said many times before, this is uh, probably the highlight of the Chatham social season. Nothing else comes close. You get a chance to rub elbows with politicians and celebrities and uh, various other people in Chatham. Uh, we will provide the chicken fingers and beer, and everybody is guaranteed to have a good time. As an aside, I had the honor yesterday of having my car washed by Mr. Matt Gilfillan and his team at St. Pat's. Why do I mention that? Well, first, it's not something you see every day. And second, uh, we will have representatives from all of the churches in town, or most of the churches in town, uh, collecting checks for mission trips. This was a car wash that was uh, to raise money for St. Pat's and Appalachia project. And we are big supporters of these mission trips. Uh, we think they give uh, high school kids an opportunity to go to places they've never been. And uh, I think that they see that not everybody lives the way we do, which is an eye opener. So everybody is invited tomorrow night. Uh, and uh, we. we uh, Guarantee a good time to everybody. Thanks. All right, on to the next one. We are going to action items. Personnel, Mr. Um, I'd like to move agenda items A1 to A25 in your regular agenda, as well as A1 <coughs> to 8 <coughs> and 26 through 29 on the agenda. Second. Okay. I just mention a couple of things. Um, first, as you can see uh, on the agenda, there is a resignation of one of our principals, Robert Bardella, at Southern Boulevard School. Uh, we are in the process of uh, determining the best path forward, and uh, in our executive session meeting tonight, we'll discuss that. Uh, I'd like to wish uh, Brooke Phillips and other staff members that appear in the agenda all the best as well. Um, my merit goal, approval, uh, the initial one, is on this agenda, and the way that process works is the board gives an initial approval, and then I have to submit to the executive county superintendent, and then she determines whether you can give final approval uh, at the next board meeting or shortly thereafter. And finally, uh, just to reiterate something Matt mentioned before, we did get an additional um, proposal from our banking partner for the bank that we use for district business. So we will be making that switch. That's on D21, so that's coming up in the next uh, the next section. Agenda items A1 to 25 and on the addendum uh, item 1, 2, 8, 20, and 26 to 29. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Chambers? Yes. Ms. Chicarelli? Yes. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Mr. Valenti? Yes. And Mr. Gilfield? Yes. Agenda items pass 6 0. Yes, I'd like to move action items B1 through 19 on your regular agenda and then 20 and 21 on your addendum. Second. And then, here we go. A lot of good stuff at the end of the year. Uh, the Chatham Education Foundation. It's a surprise, usually somebody comes and we have a- She's here. Yeah. Right. 
Is that what happened? Oh, she just walked in. I got my glasses on. Mm -hmm. She just walked in. Would you like to come up and tell us? I'll let you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Foundation, and uh, we had one final grant application from for the year, which we were very happy to approve last week. It is for what's called a thinking classroom, two thinking classrooms at Chatham High School, and the grant was written by Stacy Winters. And um, this will provide math students in um, the Algebra Two classrooms with an opportunity to learn in a vertical way thinking using glass walls to write, standing, um, learning standing, standing desks, different um, different types of seating arrangements, and it's really taking what the classroom of the future, how it's evolved in our ELA classrooms, in our design and tech classrooms, and now doing something that fits a more uh, forward-thinking math classroom. So we have the opportunity to pilot this in two classrooms, and so CEF was actually thrilled to approve this grant, and we have a check for $23,909.72. Tony's uh, from the Chad Middle School PTO. We had $22,000 for the modernization of several classrooms throughout the CMS and upgraded the food consumer science classroom. Um, Donation from the PTO of Chatham to the amount of three thousand dollars towards the Tessa Andrehan Scholarship Fund. A donation to the School District of Chatham to the amount of five hundred dollars from the Honorable <laughs> but Missing Miss Weber to the Bank of America Charitable Foundation matching contribution to the youth in the superintendent's discretion. On the acceptance of to the CHS Schipler Scholarship Fund, the amount of five hundred dollars from Mr. And Mrs. David Schipler to the amount of five hundred dollars came to. Thank everybody for that. Ted of Education Foundation, I have just one more question for you. Do you know what your total number was this year? Um, Ted of Education Foundation's total number was 104,000 and change. Wow. Okay. Can't thank you guys enough for everything you do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Agenda items B1 through 19 and number 20 and 21 on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Arnett. Yes. Ms. Chambers. Yes. Ms. Ms. Ciccarelli. Yes. Ms. Kenny. Yes. Mr. Valenti. Vote yes of the 119 of state for 20 and 21. Okay. Uh, duly noted. And Mr. Gilfield. Yes. Agenda items B1 to 19 pass 6 0, uh, 20 and 21 pass 5 0 1. On the curriculum, I imagine. This is my first attempt at this, so oh, okay. Um, I'd like to move curriculum item C1 to C4. Second. Chambers? Yes. Ms. Ciccarelli? Yes. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Ms. Valenti? Yes. And Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Agenda item is past 6 0. Very happy. One minute to start. Um, hello. Next year is Labor Day, is extremely late. 
Uh, policy, nothing. Uh, nothing to move. Nothing to move. Uh, board of business, anybody? I was going to say, it's one of my favorite times of year when you see all the brand new, unfortunately I don't have any more, uh, brand new college stickers and places on the back of cars and I'm just so proud to see them all around town and I'm not able to attend graduation this year but I really do wish the class of 2019 the best and in whatever they choose to do going forward and I hope they look back on their time here as, and I hope they had as much fun as I did in high school. Can I add something? I think uh, I'll probably speak for everyone else that I'd also like to congratulate the class, uh, and I will not be attending. But as a public service announcement, um, I believe Ms. Simon Fay might have shared this somewhere in social media land, but I think it, it's important. Uh, a lot of parents put their graduation signs in front of their houses, and they go to graduation, and one, uh, the robber, one of the things that robbers do is they look at which houses have the signs, they know when the graduation is. So please, for all the parents out there, be vigilant uh, and, and hopefully have someone in your home during this graduation while it takes place to protect your homes. Uh, sorry to be, to bring up something that's kind of a downer, but there you go. Next thing you know, when move in weekend is the colleges. Yeah. That's actually, um, it's very much a thing. I'm never leaving my house early. <laughs> um, next up is our second opportunity for public commentary. I won't be Jill and Betty, seeing nothing. We are adjourned from public. We're moving into executive session where nothing will be, no action will be handled. Thank you all. And if, is anyone here from Chatham?